Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this information session for the Master of Science in Bioethics program. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with some team introductions. So um, with us, we have Rebecca Brindell, director of the Master of Science in Bioethics program. We have Kelsey Berry and Joni Bashansky, our associate faculty directors. Crystal Chang is our Associate Director of Education, and Samantha Pitkin is our Education Recruitment Administrator, and I'm Jesse Tucker, the Education Recruitment Administrator. So um, you'll hear from many of us today, and I'm just quickly going to provide you with some notes for the session. Um, this is a webinar, so you will be able to submit questions uh, at the bottom of your screen in that Q&A section. So if you click that button at any time, you can write a question uh, and submit that over to us. And then we'll either uh, type the questions in and you'll see that in a little section called answered questions. But at the very end of the session, we'll also um, answer any questions that you have live and you'll hear from all members of the team that are here with us today. Uh, this session is being recorded and we'll post that to YouTube afterwards. There also, there's also going to be a lot of information that we'll send out after the session, and that'll be a lot of useful links, which will just kind of provide you more information uh, on what we've what we've talked about. So the agenda for today is really kind of uh, just giving you a background um, on the program. And, you know, you're going to hear from a bunch of us uh, on the team and you can kind of hear about what it's like and what you can expect uh, as a student here at Harvard Medical School. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Kelsey. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's wonderful to be here with all of you from around the world um, to think together about the Masters of Science in Bioethics program and explore whether you might consider uh, doing this study at Harvard Medical School. Um, so you might be uh, sitting in the audience thinking, well, why bioethics in particular? Uh, and it's really true that critical developments are happening in the life sciences and in population health right now at an unprecedented rate. And during this period of really rapid development, we're also asking key questions about our responsibilities to one another. So for example, how do we think about which technologies to invest in? How do we ensure that they're developed ethically? accessed equitably, and that these values of kind of care and sustainability are really upheld as we strive to advance the human condition through the life sciences and through population health. And coming out of the pandemic, especially as COVID-19 has become to wane around the world, there's really no better time to be working in bioethics in both reflecting upon some of the lessons that that moment uh, globally brought us um, and also anticipating for the future uh, challenges and opportunities that we want to ensure are thoughtfully considered um, and pinned to underlying human values. So I will say in order to do all of that big work, right, we need to understand not only the theoretical underpinnings of how we think about our moral responsibilities, but we also need to gain practical skills and experiences in applying that understanding to the challenges and those opportunities in order to make real change in the world rather than simply keeping our thoughts in the ivory tower, right? We're in an academic institution. And so on the next slide, if you're kind of compelled by this vision of bioethics, the question of why Harvard Medical School will certainly come to mind as the place of study for you. And Harvard Medical School really is an ideal place to study bioethics in large part because by coming to Harvard, you're coming to the largest biomedical research community in the world. So the Harvard teaching faculty and facilities are unprecedented, um, upwards of 13 affiliated teaching hospitals, each with their different microcultures, right? So different kinds of ethical considerations arising in each. World-class research labs, both on the HMS quad and throughout the university, combining life and social sciences from basic sciences to bench to bedside. And so students who come to HMS have access to a number of resources. Not only is there the opportunity to cross-register across the university. So we have, for example, students who are taking courses, not just at Harvard Medical School, but also at Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School, 
students who are studying at the School of Public Health and in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here. And that opportunity really allows them to get at the many dimensions of study that address questions in bioethics beyond the tailored resources that are being provided through the Masters of Bioethics program here at Harvard Medical School. And then of course, lots of opportunities uh, outside the classroom um, for lectures, events, consortia, incredible speaker series, and many more. So it's a little bit like drinking at a fire hose in some ways. You could spend more than 24 hours a day thinking and engaging topics in bioethics and yet still have more to learn, more to do. Um, and so it's a really vibrant community in that respect. There are a lot of resources to help you navigate that space. Um, and we're really committed to having a robust advising uh, system to support you in doing that work. So within Harvard Medical School, on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about the HMS Center for Bioethics. Uh, this is the center out of which the Master of Science in Bioethics degree is offered. And it's a tailored focused program for students. Uh, so the HMS Center for Bioethics um, is unique in the university in the sense that it has uh, an incredibly broad range of faculty affiliated with it. And that's really not all, right? So we have a number of peers uh, in the program, the ones that you would be studying alongside of, who are at a different range of places in their careers. So some who are relatively earlier in their careers, others who are relatively later in their careers. And this generates a really diverse set of people whose background and expertise span science, law, medicine, right, research, industry practice, uh, care, and beyond. So our center, as I said, has this breadth of affiliated faculty, this breadth of multidisciplinary leaders in your peers. And that means that we also have access to a lot of expertise. So our faculty have brought expertise in clinical ethics, research ethics, public policy and ethics, neuroethics, feminist and subaltern approaches. There's really no area of bioethics that you cannot explore while you're here at Harvard Medical School. And as I was mentioning, we have such an incredible student body. So let me tell you a little bit about them so you can start to imagine yourself amongst them. Uh, we have this year 122 students in residence, uh, 34 with us studying full time on campus, and then 88 students with us studying part time, the vast majority of whom are learning with us virtually from around the United States and around the world. And so we have students and alumni now from over two dozen countries uh, and a really, as I said, wide range of educational and professional backgrounds in that student body. As I mentioned, medicine, of course, uh, it's a medical school. So we do see a lot of folks who are coming to us with an interest in or background in medicine, but also much broader than that. So folks with a background in law, right? Public health, really thinking about our commitments to one another at the population level individuals in social work, right, in nursing, also in the allied health profession, speech pathology, language pathology, physical therapy. We have people who are focused on communications, public engagement, for example, through journalism practice, people who have worked in business settings, healthcare management, and in basic and translational research, right, in the life sciences and in the social sciences. And so all of these backgrounds amongst our student body alone really enriches the experience of being a member of the Master of Science and Bioethics community. As you can imagine, each person's perspective shapes how they think about what we owe to one another and what our responsibilities are and their ability to bring forward those perspectives in peer learning groups and in the classroom is amongst the greatest strengths of this program. I did mention we've got some folks at the beginning of our careers, those who have just graduated from undergraduate programs and are striking out on what they expect to be a lifelong commitment with health, science, and the ethical and moral values that underpin those areas of practice. And of course, we have others who are more towards the middle or even the later or top end of their careers. They're really coming back, asking these critical questions about what they've seen, experienced, been part of, right? And thinking about how to change that practice through their leadership and an awareness of ethics, values, and responsibilities, really bringing back to the places in which they work that kind of broadened theoretical and practical underpinning of bioethics. 
So if you'd like to join this community, and we hope that it's of interest to you, there are two ways that you can enter a course of study in the fall of 2024. The first that we offer is a full-time program of study on campus in the Longwood Medical Area. And this is really a focused and immersive approach to completing the program. So students studying full-time with us come to the Harvard campus in Longwood Medical Area, surrounded by all of our teaching hospitals, um, and they complete their full 36 credits of the program in one year, one academic year, from September through May in a full-time course load. And so courses are offered both in the morning and in the evening, and you can generally expect to be a full-time student. So for those of you who uh, are unable to come to the campus and study full-time, we have a second fully virtual program through which you can complete the Master of Science in Bioethics. And so that program is completed part-time over two academic years, and it's designed for a fully virtual experience now informed by several years of adapting curriculum and student experience for the online space. And what it means really is that regardless of your geographical location, you're able to have an opportunity to come and study at Harvard Medical School. So this part-time online program is really conducive to being able to continue to work in your area of practice while completing your bioethics coursework. I will make an important note though that this program is perhaps unlike some other virtual master's degree programs that you might be familiar with in the sense that all of the learning is done live, right? So we meet synchronously. We meet in a Zoom room much like this, although we're actually able to see all of one another um, in, uh, in our kind of Zoom boxes. Um, and the teachers offer the curriculum live during those Zoom meetings. Uh, so you're making real bonds with your faculty and with your cohort. Um, and this means that uh, classes right, are mandatory to attend. They're held typically in the evening um, in Eastern time. And so that's an important consideration when you think about completing the part-time course of study with the Center for Bioethics here at Harvard Medical School is just thinking about how it fits in right, to your life and your other responsibilities as a working professional. So. Regardless of the course of study, whether it's full-time on campus, part-time online, that works best for your life and location, the curriculum between the two is exactly the same. Let me tell you a little bit about that on the next slide. So the curriculum is built around a nine-month full-time attendance approach or that kind of two-year part-time attendance approach. And earlier in the slides, I mentioned that there's a real importance to not only having the theoretical underpinnings to appreciate what our responsibilities might be, but also the practical experience, the kind of outside the classroom learning that enables an individual to apply those understandings. So bioethics as an applied field really is often in the doing, right? It doesn't sit in the educational space, um, in the kind of academy and universities, but it really tries to go out into the world in a way as to support health and flourishing for all people, whether through individual experience of care, development of new research and technologies, or in thinking about population health and policy that structures our prospects for flourishing in life over our lifetimes. And so the two kind of core required pieces of our program really exemplify this commitment both to theory and to practice. And those form the cornerstones of our program. So the theory side, is our uh, course Foundations of Bioethics 1 and 2, which is taken by all students in their first year of study. And that's a year-long two-semester course that is going to introduce all students to the building blocks of bioethics knowledge and practice. Starting in the fall, we have philosophy, theology, right, and history, and some consideration of moral psychology, the sciences, how that informs our thinking about ourselves as moral agents. And then as we transition into the spring, we end with social science and political philosophy as we really think about the application of some of these moral commitments that bioethics work help us identify into our society and into public spaces. So a little bit of translational work in connection with the theory at that point. Now, Foundations of Bioethics is a rigorous course. Um, it is 10 full credits. 
Uh, and the important part is that it's paired with a number of other opportunities to start to extend that theoretical foundation into specific areas of practice. So other core classes include research ethics, introduction to clinical ethics, and health law policy and bioethics, really covering three domains in which bioethics has traditionally and will continue to make significant contributions. I mentioned that there was a second cornerstone of our program, which is the practice side. And this is really the capstone experience. I'll say a word about that in just another slide. So please put a pin in it. Um, but I did want to not neglect to mention that this is the second cornerstone of the program. So students will all complete their foundations course, their capstone experience, and their core classes. And then beyond that, there are a number of elective credits associated with the course of study that you can use to register into electives that are offered through the Master of Science in Bioethics program, or to cross-register, as I mentioned, into any number of the other schools here at Harvard University, from law to business to public health and beyond. So let me say a little bit of a word about the capstone experience because it is among the most um, compelling pieces, I think, of the program for many who are first exploring it. And in fact, from the very beginning, when the Master of Science in Bioethics was started back in 2015, it was a component of the program that we were particularly proud of and have really invested in over time to make it what it is today. As I mentioned, bioethics is very much in the doing, right? Not simply in the thinking, although that's certainly important, um, but we felt that there are a lot of critical skills that people learn simply by doing the work of bioethics that enables them to essentially step into those roles more confidently, and in a more grounded fashion than they might have otherwise been had they only stayed inside the classroom doing their learning. So what we're doing in the capstone experience is really there are two things happening. The first is we work with students over the course of the summer before they join us. Um, or if you're in the part-time program, we work with you towards the end of your first year to get you ready for capstone in the second year to come up with these mentored experiences that align with your experience level and your aims in the field of bioethics. So we match each student with a mentor who's actively working in the field of bioethics in some capacity, whether it's on the ethics side of things or the bio side of things, the bio and health side of things. And it's a real focus on gaining hands-on experience and skill building opportunities that will really help you develop your career. So we think of this capstone experience as something of a launch pad, right? So for a year, you're developing focused work in bioethics that then ends up being a really supportive transition as you go into the next phase of your career or look at returning to the spaces from which you came in translating some of the skills and work that you've been doing. That's kind of the experiential mentored part, but I don't want to neglect to mention the reflective kind of curricular part of the capstone experience. So not only over the course of the year are you engaging in this mentored experience with a faculty member, but you are also part of a longitudinal seminar throughout that year, which is led by one of our bioethics faculty. And during that seminar, which are typically very small groups of about six students each, you're digesting and considering the nature of the work that you're doing in your capstone experience alongside important curricular considerations that relate to the practice of bioethics. So for example, curricula that focus on how to practice bioethics with integrity, right? Concepts of moral courage, concepts of conflicts of interest that come up as we conduct ourselves as professionals in this field. So a lot of important considerations that really come into being a practitioner of bioethics are part of what that seminar is bringing forward and helping us digest. So let me give you a little bit more concrete sense right, of what some of this capstone experience might look like. Uh, on the next slide, I'll tell you about um, these kind of three main areas that we tend to divide capstone experiences into. Although I will note that these are broad buckets, right? 
Um, and more often than not, we're really working very closely with students, including to identify experiences in the leading edge of bioethics, which might not fit neatly into any one of these particular buckets. But I'll tell you a little bit about these because they're where the vast majority of our students tend to focus their capstone experience and work. So first, of course, we have, um, as I said, a really robust clinical ethics enterprise ongoing um, at Harvard Medical School and lots of expertise in that area amongst our faculty. And so students have done capstone experiences in the past that focus on topics and areas as wide as end of life decision making and the ethical considerations that come up in that context, all the way to decision aids, right, for the very beginning of life, for example, in labor and delivery. Um, we've also had students who uh, do work evaluating clinical ethics practice, right, looking at, for example, unit-based ethics rounds, or even shadowing people who are doing that kind of work, um, and considering the way that different ethics services and programs are set up within our institutions of care in translating that knowledge back into their own institutions as well, building new programs, improving programs, um, and really looking at the structures that facilitate high quality ethics work in healthcare settings. So of course, clinical ethics is an important component. Research ethics is another place where we have a big depth of expertise and practice going on. So students um, can conduct capstone experiences in the space of research ethics, really looking at responsible conduct of research, how institutional review boards um, help govern the work of human subjects research and bring ethical considerations into their oversight and support of research. And then also students who want to really dive into specific topical areas. So for example, we have a student this year looking at uh, how gender is conceived in the course of organizing and developing a research agenda. Um, Sex-linked biological differences, for example, as part of some of the complicating factors that go into doing research uh, with different sorts of individuals. And then as I have here on the slide, also folks who are thinking about things like contraceptive management in the course of research with adolescents. So how do we think about preserving fertility, for example, um, when there is a trial undergoing with new types of drugs and that sort of thing. So lots of different areas that can be topically developed within the space of research ethics and really tailored to your particular interests. The third bucket that I'll mention is here in the space of policy and government. And this is among, I think, one of the um, kind of underlooked areas that bioethics has contributed to in the past and has such an incredible opportunity to shape and contribute to in the future. So we know that um, considering our commitments to one another on an individual level is really important. And yet at the same time, we also want to build societies, right? And build systems and structures that allow people within them to be their best selves, right? To hold up their responsibilities to one another and to ensure that the way that they interact with one another facilitates broader values of justice, right, and flourishing. And so work in policy and government capstone experiences tend to focus on these bigger picture questions. So we've had folks, uh, students, sorry, working in areas of medical aid and dying, right, doing legislative analysis around that topic, which continues to come up in a variety of different settings. Others who have focused their work in public health, thinking about harm reduction considerations in regards to the opiate crisis. And then of course, people who are looking at specific areas, right, in which law and policy might be developed. So correctional settings, detention settings, really looking at concerns for dignity and equity in the course of thinking through how people are treated in a variety of different settings and by virtue of their backgrounds, right, and their histories. So this is just the smallest smattering of different capstone experiences that we can share with you today, but there's so many more and we've shared the abstracts of all of our capstone students' experiences from 2017 through 2023, right? So you've got kind of six years worth of capstone experiences to look at and gain inspiration from, which are available on the Master of Science in Bioethics website. We really encourage you to go take a look um, to kind of spark your curiosity and think about 
what would I want to do, right, with a year's worth of dedicated mentored time to really carry forward specific work in bioethics. And Jesse will follow up, as he mentioned, after today's session with some of these key links so that you can link directly to those resources and peruse them at your leisure. And with that, let me actually turn it on over to Samantha Pitkin, our education administrator, who will really support students throughout their time in the program to tell you about the various resources here at Harvard Medical School beyond the bioethics specific content that you'll be engaging. Awesome, thanks Kelsey, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, hi everybody. So as a student, um, as part of the Masters of Bioethics program here, uh, there are a host of resources that are open to you, uh, both at the university-wide level of Harvard, uh, through HMS specifically, and then through our Office of Graduate Education, uh, which really manages and governs all of the master's programs here at HMS. And these are wide ranging resources, right, from career services and career advising all the way down to accommodations uh, and services for students with disabilities. Um, we have a whole variety of things to, to keep you covered and engaged while you're here. Um, most recently, we just recognized, you know, our wellness week um, and mental health days. So we send out a whole bunch of resources for those. Um, and then there are plenty of events you can also attend. Um, which we promote through our own center, but also you can find them through the Harvard Gazette. Um, and I'm sure Jesse will follow up with some links on, on these as well, but I encourage you to take a look at our website and also take a look at the Office for Graduate Education's website to learn a little bit more about what we offer because uh, there, there truly is a lot and I don't think we could cover it all today. So I'll move on to one of our more specific uh, uh, things that we offer here for our students, uh, which is advising and networking. Uh, so all of our students in the program are paired strategically with a faculty advisor um, upon entry into the program. And if you're a one-year student or a two-year student, you stay with this advisor throughout your entire tenure uh, through graduation. And I know plenty of our students also interact with their past advisors as alums, which is fantastic. Uh, and this faculty advisor is really there to talk not just about your course selection, but also about your program specific goals and your career goals post-graduation. Um, and that's why we strategically pair you, right? So we're pairing you with leaders in the field who have um, an interest and experience in things that you're also studying uh, and have indicated to us that you're interested in pursuing uh, post-graduation. So that's a really great resource that we offer to everybody and we highly encourage everyone to take advantage of it. Uh, it's also required that you take advantage of it, but um, we, we expect that you don't just meet with your advisor to the minimum, uh, you really maximize that experience. Kelsey mentioned this uh, when talking about the capstone experience, but a large part of the capstone experience is working on your kind of facilitated guided project with a paired mentor. Um, this is also something that you're strategically uh, placed with. So our capstone directors do a fantastic job of gathering all of this survey information that we ask you to provide about what you're interested in pursuing for your capstone project um, and where you'd like to take it and really taking our, you know, network of uh, folks in the bioethics field um, and matching you appropriately. Um, and these people are also a resource for you throughout your entire time in the program and post-graduation. Uh, we have plenty of people who have gone on to continue research and continue on with their capstone projects, even after you know, their seminar class has ended. Um, so I highly recommend taking a look through those abstract booklets um, and seeing what some of our past students have done with their mentors. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we like to have fun at the Center for Bioethics. So there are a lot of social and professional events that we offer. Um, we'll talk probably a little bit more about these, but these include things like consortia. Uh, we have our annual gay lecture coming up. Um, plenty of other kind of informal virtual networking opportunities for our part time students. Um, and then a, a whole host of in person activities. Uh, this year, we're piloting something uh, called the Passport Program, where we're encouraging students to come to as many events as possible um, and get these stamps in your passport um, to kind of keep track of all of the fun things you're doing outside of the classroom. But there's also, of course, a prize incentive uh, at the end of this. So a whole host of things that are available. And please feel free to check out the events uh, section of our website. There are plenty of things that are open to you um, as just an affiliate of the community as well. And I believe I'm going to pass this back to Kelsey to dive into some more consortia related things. Thank you, Sam. 
Um, so I hope that you're getting a sense now as to just how robust the support structures here are at Harvard Medical School and in the Center for Bioethics. Um, and this is really important, right, because the center is an incredibly active place and it's helpful to have some navigation, right, as you think about what sorts of opportunities you want to take on. Uh, so the program, right, the Master of Science in Bioethics really takes advantage of the fact that it's situated in this working, active center for bioethics. And what I mean by that is that our faculty, our affiliates, they are all actively doing bioethics work in addition to the teaching that they're doing in the program. And we know that bioethics really shouldn't be practiced in a vacuum, right? The best work happens when we come together to discuss the challenges that we're seeing and potential approaches or solutions as we think through those challenges. So those conversations take place in a number of settings in the center. I think the most prominent is really through these consortia series that we offer, which are all open to our Master of Science students. And these consortia at the Center for Bioethics give students exposure to real-time cases, right, challenges, and ongoing work in the field. So really cutting-edge contemporary issues that are coming in front of our faculty as they do their work um, that demand um, conversation, unpacking, and better understanding through community-based approach. So as you can see, we have four types of consortia that are offered through the center. Students are all encouraged to attend these consortia and learn in real time. Um, I'll just mention uh, kind of contents of the four of them. Clinical ethics, of course, is a consortium in which uh, real-time cases are discussed. So uh, clinical ethics consultations that are going on in our affiliated teaching hospitals um, are brought to that consortia where we go through a patient case um, and look at the process, the considerations that came up in addressing the particular issues in that patient case. Uh, we also have a consortium in ethics and research in biotechnology. So really looking at um, cutting edge research on the edge of bioscience, right? The development of brain organoids, right? Some of the most um, uh, contemporary research that is going on and the considerations, moral considerations that arise in not only framing that research, but bringing it translationally into the world. We also have consortia on health policy and bioethics. So looking at some of the ongoing policy developments uh, domestically or internationally and considering the moral dimensions of those policy developments uh, in conversation with experts who themselves might be framing or informing the policies that are coming out. And then also organizational ethics or a consortium that's really focused at the meso level, thinking about healthcare institutions, right? Um, in the United States, insurance companies that provide health insurance and how each of these organizations kind of navigate their environment ethically, such that they're creating conditions, right? For clinicians within them or for the patients that they serve to actually realize their full, um, their full responsibilities and their potential for flourishing. So each of these consortia takes up a little bit of a different slice of the bioethics terrain. Um, and as I said, students are encouraged to attend them for um, real-time kind of contemporary learning in bioethics. There's also special tutorials that we've aligned with these consortia for our master's students that allow them to dig deeper into the cases after the public programming. And as I kind of alluded to, some of these consortia events are in fact open to the public um, as part of our work in public engagement and translating bioethics outside of the academy. Um, and you can therefore already attend them, many of them if you wish. Uh, select consortia are not open to the public. So for example, the Clinical Ethics Consortium um, as it's bringing real patient, um, real patient cases and consultations to the table. Uh, we have to uh, consider confidentiality um, interests as part of our ethical commitment to the um, patients and teams who are generous enough to share their, um, their background and experiences with us. So these consortia are really a core part of the learning that goes on at the center that is extracurricular and can also be curricular as well. And I'll mention another event series that we run uh, from year to year on the next slide, which is the um, George W. Gay Lecture on Medical Ethics. So this is a lecture series that we've invested quite a lot of time in bringing 
global leaders in the life sciences, biosciences, health, and ethics into the center. It really informs the life of the center. And the George W. Gay Lecture is the oldest main lecture at HMS hosted by the Center for Bioethics. So we're actually just approaching our next George W. Gay Lecture next month in November. Uh, and our speaker will be Dr. Stephen Hyman, who is the global leader in genomics, neuroscience, and mental health. Um, he previously served as the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health in the United States and is currently a core member of the Broad Institute um, a basic translational science uh, research institute crossing MIT and Harvard, um, and directs the Center for Psychiatric Research. He's a global leader in neuroethics, and he's going to come talk to us about the science and ethics of behavior control, right, as it relates to new technologies and diseases spanning addiction, obesity, and ADHD. Um, his picture is not here on this slide because we're still developing it, the, the kind of banner for his lecture um, to come in November. But you can see from the pictures on this slide just how broad the scope of speakers and work is that have been represented um, by these national and international scholars um, who have offered the gay lecture over the years. So we've had scholars, for example, the last year's was Dr. Ruben Warren, who really leads um, bioethics through his work in public health ethics as a director of the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. Um, and that might ring some bells for you uh, if you're kind of following the field. He's done a lot of work looking at the United States Public Health Service syphilis study that occurred at Tuskegee. Um, which really raised a lot of concerns about research oversight um, and atrocities in the United States. And so I mentioned him, I won't tell you about everyone else, but we really have um, just an incredible group of people who have come to enrich the life of the center through their work um, as named lecturers with the George W. Gay Lecture. On the next slide, um, I will also uh, invite you really to approach this community as an inclusive community. And this is one of our core values at the Center for Bioethics um, and more broadly at the medical school. So we've invested very significantly in developing a more inclusive community over the years and really living these values of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging here at the medical school through a number of initiatives, which you can see uh, perhaps are even in too small font for you to see, but have really been thoughtfully constructed to ensure that all of the students who come to study at the medical school are really supported in their studies here and as members of the community. So there are a number of resources that have been developed at the level of Harvard University and at the level of Harvard Medical School, but we're also doing this work internally at the center and in the Master of Science program very um, intensively. So, for example, considering how to increase the diversity um, and um, of topics and expertise amongst our faculty, as well as lived experiences and backgrounds. And the same with our students, right, and the various areas of emphasis that bioethics brings its attention to. And so just one example you'll see there at the bottom of the slide um, is that beginning in 2021, we launched a series of programming during Black History Month in February. Uh, with a particular focus on the dimensions of Black history and bioethics and possibilities for the next generations. In 2023, we looked at the values of respect and healing in bioethics, looking both internally at some important work that Harvard has been doing to restore the remains of enslaved persons that were unearthed on the Harvard campus, um, and then also some forward-looking work in thinking about how we can carry commitments to ethical research forward in working with minoritized communities. And so there are other um, examples from the prior two years of these lecture series, uh, which we encourage you to take a look at um, and consider the various ways in which bioethics intersects with society in ways that have not always been thoroughly unpacked, but that we as a center are really committed to developing programming and understanding around. And that's really all amidst these kind of robust services to welcome and support students, um, many of which Sam just uh, kind of shared, you, shared with you, but these include our Better Together plan, a Harvard University-wide plan for diversity and inclusion, um, as well as strong mental health and wellness counseling services. So 
with all of that, and you've heard a lot, I'm going to pass it on over to Jesse to give you um, some more detail about studying in the program. Thanks, Kelsey. So what you see here is the tuition and fees for the current academic year. And one thing to note is that uh, for when you apply, so for next year, you might see these prices rise by two to two and a half percent. Um, if you're covered by your own health insurance, or you plan to be when you enroll in the program, uh, you can waive that health insurance fee. And we'll share a resource after the session all about the cost of attendance. And if you're looking to come study in person, um, then you'll you can see a list of what we estimate to be your cost of living expenses as well. So on the next slide, I think we'll talk a bit about financial aid. If you could switch the slide over. Uh, thanks, Sam. So um, for U.S. citizens and permanent residents, of course, you have access to federal direct uh, unsubsidized and graduate plus loans. And those loans can cover a part uh, of the cost of tuition, or they can cover all of the cost of tuition. You also have access to a work-study program, so for a certain number of hours here on campus uh, and for Harvard, um, you can work. Now, it's always a good idea to check with your current employer if you do plan to do this uh, part-time, uh, as there may be a number of HR benefits, um, maybe they're willing to pay a certain percentage of your tuition. So it would just be a good idea to call up your employer and see if they have anything available to help you out. For international students, um, after the session, we have a great resource uh, that we'll share with you, and that is the Harvard Committee on General Scholarships. They have a very large list of scholarships by different countries. Um, you know, and hopefully you can find yours and maybe there's something there. We also encourage international applicants to really check with their home country um, or to check with their institution to see if they have any type of funding. And that can be at your, you know, local uh, or even the federal level. So we definitely encourage you to do that. If you're here and you're uh, at Harvard Medical School or you're at one of our affiliated hospitals, there is a 10% discount that you can take advantage of. Now, if you are, or you think you're gonna be in need of some financial assistance to pay tuition, we do have the HMS Dean's Scholarship application and information on that should be available uh, at the start of 2024. So if that's you, I encourage everyone to apply to uh, the Dean's Scholarship, and that's a 15% reduction in tuition. And that also applies for, doesn't matter if you're in person uh, or if you're online. So next we can talk about some housing options. And you have, of course, a couple of options if you're studying with us in person. So you can study on campus um, and you can live right here near campus, uh, near the medical school. And that would be at Vanderbilt Hall. And there's also uh, Harvard at Trilogy, which is very close to campus. There is also options to live over in Cambridge, um, where the Harvard University is, where Harvard College is. Um, you know, and that's, that's usually not a problem for anyone because there's a free Harvard shuttle. You just show your ID and uh, that shuttle will take you from the uh, Harvard Yard right over to the, uh, Vanderbilt Hall, so right next to where you're going to have some classes. You're also, of course, welcome to live off campus. And as you can see here, there are two links which we'll send you after. And so that Harvard housing off campus is a really wonderful resource. Um, and then, you know, you can live right next to the medical school. You can still live in Cambridge or you can live anywhere in the surrounding area, of course. Uh, next, I think we're going to talk about the admissions process a little bit. So I think first, I would just like to point out, right, there are two deadlines. And so if you're applying for the in-person in program, that's January 5th. Um, and so no matter what, if you want to come study with us in person, please apply by January 5th. If you are studying if you're applying to study for the online program, uh, that deadline is March 1st. Now, the requirements 
uh, for successful application, right, is a transcript from all institutions that you have mentioned in your application, your CV or your resume, a statement of purpose, three letters of recommendation, and a $100 application fee. It is totally optional if you have taken tests recently and you would like to also include those as part of your application. So for international applicants, if you studied at an institution where the primary language of instruction was not in English, um, then you will have to submit an English language proficiency test score. And you can do that um, three ways. So I think if you, you know, if you're an international student, you do need to provide us that test. If you have any questions, definitely please let us know. So now we can give you some admissions tips. So your statement of purpose, that should really cover, it should really be a thoughtful narrative of why you want to study bioethics, why it's important to you, and also why here at Harvard. Now, it shouldn't be too short and it shouldn't be too long. Definitely try and keep it between the 500 to 750 words. Um, please include a, a, an updated resume. And lastly, and very importantly, start your conversations with your recommenders early. Um, you know, you don't want to start it just two weeks before you plan to actually, before the deadline, um, you know, they could get sick uh, or they could be really busy. So, so, you know, start talking to them now, make sure you're telling them why you're interested uh, in this program and why it's the right next step for you. So thanks for listening to us for so long so far. Now we are going to go ahead and get started with our live questions and answers. Um, just a reminder in that Q&A pop-up that you can have, there is an answered section. So you can review all of the answers so far that we've been typing out. But right now we'll go ahead and answer some of them live. And I know that Kelsey uh, is going to answer two of those live, so I'll open it back up to her. Thanks so much, Jesse. Uh, so we did get a question um, from a pediatric ophthalmologist and ocular geneticist in our Q&A box here, um, really just checking in on how the capstone experience might differ for students who are studying in person um, versus those who are enrolled in the virtual program. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment to, to let you know that each capstone experience is different. And so that means that even if you have uh, multiple students studying in person, the way that they arrange their capstone experience will differ considerably from one to the next. Um, but for those who are you know, studying virtually, we have a broad array of faculty who are very familiar with mentoring in a virtual setting. Um, and so inevitably that will mean that many instances you will actually be meeting with your faculty um, or your capstone mentor uh, in kind of a live Zoom space. Um, and there are opportunities, of course, through the virtual uh, kind of burgeoning, right, of virtual activity to be part of many of the experiences that are happening locally in Harvard Medical School. Um, so whether that's an ethics committee meeting, which is happening on Zoom, right, there are a lot of ways in which students who are virtual are still doing the capstone in a way that is situated, right, within the local community at Harvard Medical School. But that's really not all. So this uh, virtual experience opens up a huge array of additional possibilities for capstone, including, for example, doing work at your own home institution, right, with the mentorship and support of one of the faculty members at the Center for Bioethics in Harvard. And so that might mean that a good amount of your capstone work is happening locally for you, but the learning experience and the processing learning, setting the plan, the agenda, thinking it through, is really happening in that kind of virtual connection with your faculty mentor. So um, if you've seen one capstone, you've seen one capstone. <laughs> you have not seen them all. Um, and I acknowledge as well, this was kind of a second piece of the question, that many different countries will have kind of different norms, laws, regulations that are relevant for bioethics. And so how do we accommodate the fact of that diversity within our student body? Um, and this is something that we're really attentive to as we've built quite an international program. So for example, as I mentioned, one of our core courses is in health law policy and bioethics. 
that course has something of a domestic flavor, right? It really focuses on some of the structures in the United States that frame the work of health and life sciences. And so we also have alternatives for students who are coming to us internationally for them to really develop their interests and understanding of how bioethics crosses borders. So through, for example, courses in global health ethics or other forms of um, kind of systems and population level courses like health and human rights that really allow students to gain the foundational learning that is then applicable to their own settings and their own contexts of law and policy. So I'll uh, thank you for those questions very much. Um, we did have, I think, a few more questions in the, um, in the Q&A here that I think we can answer live for the benefit of all. Uh, shall I go forward, Jesse, with another one, or how'd you like to do this? Yeah, well, how about I read this one out loud? So from Nadine asks, does the part-time program allow for students who wish to attend some classes in person? Um, I work hybrid, but could arrange to attend some classes in person a few times per month. So if you're going to take the part-time online program and you are a U.S. citizen and you wish to come to campus, we do offer J-term. And so in January, you can come and you can take an accelerated elective, I think, over three to four weeks. And if, you know, if you're in the United States, but you're in the online program, yes, you're totally welcome to come and do that in person uh, and meet some of your, you know, fellow classmates uh, and, you know, and kind of get to be part of the community here on the ground as well. So that's the option that we have for that. Any other questions? Um, feel free to type those in and any of us are more than happy to answer them. We do have a question from Jeffrey. Um, asking about the time commitment associated with the part-time virtual program and when those classes tend to meet. Um, so generally speaking, we, you, you think of each credit that a student is taking as requiring around two hours or so worth of work. And so generally students might be coming in their first semester in the part-time program to take about 10 credits. Um, so the part-time program really is part-time in the sense that it's thought of as half of a full working week. So if we think of a full working week as 40 hours per week, we would think of the part-time program as requiring 20 hours of dedicated engagement. Now, this is inclusive, right, of the time that you spend in class, um, kind of learning in real time, as well as all of the work that you're doing associated with preparing for that class, so readings, um, that homework, and any associated writing assignments. Um, so all in, right, we're really looking at kind of an 18 to 20 hour time commitment through the part-time program. The classes themselves for the part-time program do meet, as we mentioned, in the evenings, Eastern time. Um, standardly, we'll have core, course, course, core courses, sorry, around 7 p.m. Eastern, although electives and other courses may start earlier, earlier around 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Um, and these are only during the weekdays, right? So no classes are meeting on the weekends. The weekends are yours um, to catch up on what you're uh, preparing for class and um, to spend time, right, um, outside of the Master of Science and Bioethics program. Thanks, Kelsey. Yeah, so we do have a, a couple free minutes. So if you have any more questions, uh, now is the time to ask. I did want to read one that we answered earlier in the session um, that I think might be important for everyone. So how is the application slash admissions process different for the in-person versus the online program format? And can you apply to both formats if you are currently unsure? So the requirements for the application that we went over earlier, those are totally the same for both programs. Um, really, the only difference being the the date the deadline uh, that, you know, that applies to you. Now you cannot apply to both programs. Um, you know, within our application, you can't choose both formats. You have to select one. So definitely, you know, carefully review the resources or rewatch the session to think about which one's right for you. And any of us, you know, are happy to meet with you as well before you submit that application. Uh, so we can help you decide if that's something that's that's helpful to you. Now we do have two more questions. Can this master's uh, degree be paired with another master's program uh, for dual degrees, such as an LLM in health law at Harvard? 
So the answer to that uh, is no. And, uh, you know, other people can expand on this, but especially if you're here full time, this is a, it's a very, you know, rigorous program. Um, it's, you know, it's September to May. So it would be very difficult to, to kind of, you know, do two at once and have a dual degree sort of program. Now, what sort of career opportunities are available to an MBE holder? Um, I'm kind of happy to pass this off to uh, to Kelsey. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so as you can tell from the wide range of backgrounds that we described uh, represented amongst our student body, I think people want to do very different things with their master's in bioethics degree. Um, but generally speaking, we tend to see folks who are coming at the early part of their careers for a master's degree soon after their undergraduate um, learning to then go on to pursue terminal degrees, whether it's in medicine, law, PhDs, for example, um, as well as other master's programs, for example, in social work as they develop their professional footprint and then enter into those spaces. So they're doing bioethics through their work in clinical care, for example, or through their work in law. Um, so that's kind of for, for the earlier career folks. Um, and through that kind of stacking of a professional degree, a terminal degree, people are really able to make the most of a bioethics degree in the sense of being able to situate themselves as, for example, a clinical ethics consultant, whether they're with a law background or a medicine background in the healthcare space. Um, we're also increasingly seeing a lot of industry, right, bring in people professionally to be thoughtful about the bioethics of the research um, that is going on in those spaces. Um, so, for example, Google has developed a bioethics department um, where it's actually looking at how to sustain such an enterprise. Uh, we're also seeing with a lot of healthcare technology flourishing that these kinds of roles um, are really growing in the field. Um, beyond that, of course, there's a lot of professional work that goes on in research ethics with respect to institutional review boards um, and with respect to creating the frameworks from a legal and policy perspective that support the development of, um, of ethical research around the world. Um, so see, these are some of the tracks that people tend to pursue. Uh, for our more kind of mid and later career professionals who are coming to us already with quite a footprint in their professional careers, what we're really seeing for them is that they might either use this degree as a way to kind of pivot right to another portion of their interests, um, or they might take the training and the work that they've done during the program to parlay that into additional leadership positions within their organizations, leadership positions that allow them to think ethically about strategy, policies, and approaches um, to education within their settings um, that really help them grasp at another kind of component, right, of their work. Uh, so it varies quite a bit, I think, depending on what your particular goals are, but the kind of career field, right, for bioethics is increasingly blossoming, especially as we've seen over the last, last few years, not only some of the developments in technology with respect to artificial intelligence and medicine, but also some of these really critical considerations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the many things that the pandemic helped draw our attention to as we think about the import of ethics in developing hospital and healthcare policies, as well as those policies at the public health level. Um, so just a, a really dynamic, I think, career space for folks in this area. Thanks, Kelsey, that was really helpful. Um, I know we do have one minute left here, so quickly we'll just get to this one last question. Uh, maybe a member of the team here could answer that. Is there advising options, uh, excuse me, is there advising available for those applying to terminal degrees like law or medicine, or is advising more for career placement? Yeah, I'm happy to help answer that. Um, so if that's something you indicate um, at the kind of application phase um, when applying to the program, um, as well as once you've entered the program, we use all of your kind of survey results and interests to help guide your placement with your faculty advisor. Um, so we would certainly take that into consideration and likely pair you with someone who has experience pursuing an LLM or um, you know uh, a secondary degree beyond the MBE. Um, there are 
a host of advising workshops offered through the Career Services Center. Um, and some of those may be workshops that are tailored towards preparing an application for a second higher degree. Um, a lot of them are career oriented, but it's uh, we have plenty of students, um, as Kelsey has mentioned, uh, especially those who are coming to us post-grad uh, from their undergraduate program who are intending to apply to medical school or other programs uh, once they complete the master's um, of bioethics here. So um, there are certainly people who can help guide you through that process. Um, and our network um, is extensive and could certainly assist you uh, with those questions as well. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so I think with that, we're going to um, wrap it up and talk just quickly about what the next steps are. So, you know, decide on which program you think that uh, is best for you. And those deadlines, again, are January 5th for in-person and March 1st for the online. Um, you know, we do host a lot of public events. There's a lot of stuff on our website and there's a lot of recordings on our YouTube page, all of which will be shared after this session. So um, please check those out. Uh, if you want to kind of keep abreast of stuff that we're doing, we do have a newsletter that you're welcome to subscribe to. And then we're on all sorts of various um, social media. So with that, I just want to thank you all for attending. Um, and thanks to the team with me here today. I think this was a great info session and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.